not as a session to try to convince uh, people about the need to include persons with disabilities in climate action, including just transition, but more to bring in particular to the attention of the disability caucus, which, who, which does not need to be convinced about the need for disability inclusive climate action. But I think it's fair to say that within that context, the element of employment, green jobs, just transition was probably not at the top of the priorities of disability organizations, which were more concerned, and rightly so, about many other impacts of climate change on persons with disabilities. Therefore, I was ha very happy to see, and I contributed a bit to that, that the International Disability Alliance, when preparing its um, advocacy messages for COP28, one of the three or four main messages, and uh, thanks to Elham for, for that, was focusing on the needs to, for persons with disabilities to be uh, included in, in, in the Just Transition work program that is negotiated at, at this session. Um, and as, as he just mentioned, we are in the middle of that fight right now. So from that point of view, it's very good to have Ida directly uh, influencing uh, that negotiation. So I'm um, joined at this session today by three colleagues, um, Elham Yousefian, uh, a person who has a very light agenda in Ida. She only works on climate change, on disaster risk reduction, on humanitarian action. So three very light, uh, light agendas. We, ha we are joined here by Ambrose Murangida from um, Light for the World Uganda, who is a great advocate for persons with disabilities in Uganda. And we, ha we are joined here by Juan Carlos Mendoza, and I read out the title, who is Director on Environment, Climate, Gender, and Social Inclusion in IFAD, the International Fund on I Agricultural Development. Um, I was mentioning to Juan Carlos that it's great to see uh, in his title that it, he brings together the two dimensions that we are trying to bring together here um, also in our session. Because in many other organizations, and the ILO is one of them, the work on climate change, on green jobs, and the work on, on gender, on disability, or broader uh, inclusion is in different departments. No? While I, in your uh, responsibility, you have uh, both um, mandates and others uh, un under your department, which is very nice to see. Uh, we were supposed also to be joined um, today by the, UN, the newly appointed UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, Heba Hagras from Egypt. Um, unfortunately, she was unable to get the blue badge, um, but when I met with her just a few weeks ago in, in Geneva, she mentioned that one of her first thematic reports will be on climate change and disability. And I already mentioned to her also that in that report, we would be happy to contribute from the ILO side to also address the employment dimension of, of that, um, of that in intersection. No, so that's also, I think, uh, in something that we can uh, look forward to, to that. I also wanted to mention that um, it's great to have light, both Light for the World and IFAD on the, on the podium because we are currently implementing a project um, between Light for the World, the ILO, and uh, Procasur, an organization in Chile, which is about promoting rural transform, uh, disability in rural transformation. And this is a project that is funded by IFAD, and I hope it is helping IFAD, or will help IFAD, to more systematically include persons with disabilities throughout its work. I have been following the work that IFAD has been doing on disability over the last two or three years, as part also of the United Nations Disability Inclusion Strategy, and I was uh, impressed by how much uh, IFAD has upgraded, improved its work on disability inclusion in a very, very short amount of time. So kudos to um, Juan Carlos, to, to IFAD, for, um, for focusing so much on persons with disabilities, and I'm happy that through our project we can further help on that. If you're okay, uh, and thanks now, uh, good to see a few uh, other colleagues uh, joining the meeting. Um, I would like to very briefly share the main findings of a publication that we launched just uh, three weeks ago on promoting a uh, the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the green transition. And this is a joint initiative between the ILO and our Global Business and Disability Network and Spanish Fundación ONCE. And this is, a, this is the third of a, of, a, of a series of publications where we have basically been looking at what do we need to do to make the future labor market more inclusive of persons with disabilities? No? I don't need to remind you about the current gaps in terms of employment participation, in terms of working conditions. 
and our hope, of course, is that the future labor market is more inclusive of persons with disabilities. We produce a first report more generally on future of work, a second one on digital economy, and this is now the third one where we are focusing on what we hope are the opportunities that the green economy provides for to ensure a better participation of persons with disabilities in that. So the, the report very briefly outlined the effects of climate change and on the world of work, nothing specific on disability, more the general trend. It then tries to identify challenges and opportunities in the context of grand, uh, green transition from the point of view of persons with disabilities. And it finishes by making some recommendations to the different stakeholders um, in that regard. The report analyzes uh, nine different sectors. Those sectors that we were considered were sectors that are more likely to be um, in the greening process. So of course it's energy. We've heard so much about energy these days here in, in Dubai. Transportation, mobility, construction, real estate, manufacturing, agriculture, farming, and fishing. Very relevant here, of course, for our colleagues uh, from IFAD. Water supply management, waste management, forestry, and tourism. And we were looking at it both from the point of view of there are jobs that will be created new, jobs that will disappear, jobs that will be replaced, and some that will be transformed. Some common conclusions, uh, the green transition will provide additional jobs with various skill levels and qualifications, very important also. There are very high level jobs and very more basic jobs, and you find persons with disabilities uh, that have skills in, in all those areas, so it's very important that. There's an opportunity to mitigate the current job polarization uh, in this transformation. Also we, we looked a bit also into the interaction of the digital and the green economies. Education and training is fundamental, access to skills. If we don't, make, if we don't ensure that persons with disabilities have access to the relevant green skills, so to say, and that should happen through mainstream education, mainstream vocational training, then again we will, we will replicate the current uh, low levels of employment of persons with disabilities. Um, we looked at some of the key aspects of the just and green transition. It's about empowerment and training, of course, social dialogue, a key element for the, from the ILO perspective. We need to ensure that persons with disabilities and their organizations are part of the conversations that are happening in this area. Of course, it's about inclusion, it's accessibility, and it's also the very important role of social protection. Again, another area of uh, mandate within the ILO. We have been doing a lot of work in the context of disability inclusive social protection. We need now to apply that, that good work also to the, to the element of the green transition. It's clear that uh, we need all, all, everybody to be involved in, in this. We need public administration, of course. We need the corporate sector. We have in the ILO, we coordinate the ILO Global Business and Disability Network and at, their last, at our last conference, it's when we first launched this, this report, and we sent a reminder to the companies that were there, many of which are now here in Dubai, in the green zone, most of them, uh, that perhaps they are not yet making a connection between the work that they are doing on climate change and the good work that they're doing on disability. And so always this connecting of the dots within organizations, for me, is fundamental. Of course, the role of trade unions and, and worker representatives Perhaps we can go back again. Um, the, the role of training institutions is fundamental, and of course, the role of disability NGOs as champions and advocates to permanently remind all other stakeholders about the need for disability inclusive green transition. Now, in the final slide, um, we also, towards the end of, the, of this report, we also realized that this was just a first report. I'm not saying that we have all the answers in that report. I think on such a very complex topics, it is a first attempt to put the issue higher on the agenda to improve the narrative that we all can use when we lobby, when we advocate for, for disability inclusive green transition. But of course there are issues that we could not uh, go more detailed. We need to have better data. We need to do more research on the specific skills uh, and accommodations that are needed in the green economy. We need to improve our own understanding of the green economy. We had just some discussions these days whether the care economy is also a green part of the green economy or not, independent of whether it's not it definitely plays a key role in, uh, in the transformation of the economy in general and also in the context of the green economy. And then, of course, we also identified as a perhaps a more philosophical question is there is this discussion about it's not only about the green economy in terms of green skills and green jobs. It's also about do we need to change the way in which our societies are organized, our lifestyles and all that. 
And again, from a, from a disability point of view, persons with disabilities and the organizations need to be part also in this more, let's say, global philosophical uh, discussions. Okay, that was a bit quick, I think. <laughs> At least I felt I sp spoke very fast. Um, so sorry for that. And then I had planned to ask both uh, Elham and Ambrose and also Juan Carlos, if you want, to uh, make some first uh, reflections in terms of, I know Ambrose, I will start with you. You, you, have, you were kind enough to, to tell me that you had read the report. <laughs> Kudos to you for that. We don't have time lately so to read reports, but you managed to read it. You even said that you liked the report. So I was just wondering, your first reactions when reading the, the, the report. Thank you, thank you very much, IRO, and also I will thank my colleagues from the AFID, uh, who made the participation of people disability, even making me participate in this event. I thank you very much, Thomas. Also, I welcome my colleague, Elham from IBA. Nice meeting you for this side event. Back to the question. Well, there are many issues, but this publication, I can say, is timely. As we see, many researches have been done and they have been missing out. Some focus on disability when it comes to climate action. Even within organizations or persons with disabilities, there's a knowledge gap because people with disabilities don't know. What we talk of green economy, many persons with disabilities are not familiar with this. So this publication is a blessing and really it is going to raise an awareness. Even personally, it's very helpful. And it helped me to familiarize myself what it all means. Because when we talk of just transition, what does it mean? Secondly, interesting in the report, the way it's structured around the nine sectors, which are very key. It also explains uh, about different kind of, on each uh, area, each sector, which it should be done. Because when you look at development corporations, always think that they need to have one roadmap to do everything, yet no one size fits all, which is very wrong. So if you have some specific areas of attention per sector, as per the presentation, this is very good. We need also to do what we call a barrier analysis per the sector to identify those barriers, when we identify them, it becomes very easy to create solutions. Because if you are looking at the employment sector, what could be the barriers? That could be different from uh, agriculture. So what, that's what I liked from the report. The third issue I liked, many findings listed are based in Europe, though, but they can be applicable or to African context or even Asia. Looking at the structuring, it indicates which stakeholders are very key, uh, who could play a very key role in different countries. But if you are to ask me what I could as well add on, if you want to contextualize it, this publication to the African context or setting, I would say that you could add on two key stakeholders in this, one of which are the religious leaders or religious institutions in Africa, I can tell you. They are mushrooming churches and also they have a number of followers and hence they have a lot of influence on climate change. The second stakeholder, which I would recommend, are the traditional leaders. Traditional leaders in Africa, they dominate a lot. We have the kingdomship, cultural institutions, cultural settings, and they own big chunks of land. 
they have a say on how to use those properties or land. So I feel those key stakeholders are really important and can apply to African context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambrose. I remember in the work that we have been doing in Malawi within the IFAD funded project, the, um, the, the connection with, with, uh, with, the, um, with the leaders, with the traditional leaders, our colleague in Malawi said, if we don't get their buy-in, we are, <laughs> we are done. So that was, that was so th thanks a lot for, uh, for adding that, that contextual context, which yeah, coming from a European vision, it's something that would we that had not thought about. No? Um, Elham, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this opportunity. I congratulate uh, ILO team and partners for this important and timely report. Um, I think it's a great addition because you know we do talk about in the advocacy that we do on climate change and disability inclusion. We do talk about just transition, but so far we didn't have such a um, such a uh, comprehensive um, report to help and guide us through us our advocacy. This is a brand new publication, so I mean uh, that was actually one of our motivations, as you mentioned, to include uh, just transition in part of our work uh, and our advocacy key messages for. COP28, and I really hope that uh, our colleagues right now are trying uh, everywhere to bring disability into the work uh, program on just transition succeed. But uh, I think that's something that uh, I, I personally very much look forward to explore more. Um, and I think it would be great if we can have like a easy to read versions of it, like a, a plain language version of it uh, available in other languages, in other formats, accessible formats. Um, and even maybe a small uh, module about that so people can, uh, people with disabilities can learn in particular focusing on um, what advocacy can be uh, done based on this uh, report recommendations and findings. I think just transition, uh, if I want to use a very easy language, I would say it's a hit or miss uh, opportunity for disability movement. It can be a hit for us if we use this uh, transition as an opportunity to not only keep the current op job opportunities, but also open up the new job market for people with disabilities, make workplaces more accessible, may, uh, make remote workspaces more inclusive and accessible for people with disabilities and uh, help people with disabilities be more included in the society. Um, because as we all know, like um, source of income, having a strong source of income is a key um, part of uh, growing and uh, achieving other human rights. But it's going to be a missed opportunity if we do not manage to integrate um, disability inclusion in national government policies, programs, the way they implement those uh, just transition policies at national level. And uh, this report is going to help us to turn this to a hit or uh, achievement opportunity. So I think um, I really welcome this report. I hope that it is followed by some um, opportunities to explore, to introduce this to people with disabilities, tell them what is this report, how they can use it in their work, and maybe followed by some uh, supporting material to make it more uh, useful for people with disabilities. Thank you, Elham, and thank you also for these uh, recommendations. Uh, as you know, we are currently uh, starting to implement uh, a UN-funded uh, program between, um, implemented between UNDP, uh, um, Oritage. Oritage, oh, thank you, um, and ILO, and the International Disability Alliance on disability-inclusive climate action. Uh, and the part that the ILO will be leading on is the just transition part of that. And definitely within those activities, we can do exactly what you were saying. No? Also, bring, bringing the, 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 these materials, first uh, producing uh, al uh, alternative formats for those materials, but also coming under perhaps with advocacy suggestions also for disability organizations. I had initially um, agreed with Juan Carlos that he would be doing only the closing remarks but uh, I've now convinced him, although to come in already now, he will still do the closing remarks, but I wanted to, to already s s hear from you from what, uh, what you heard, which was very quick, and I know you had not the time to, to look at the report, but just some first reactions to what you heard. 
Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I think one point that I like to, to emphasize that I like very much on the presentation, I think Ambrose also mentioned it, is that this is a matter that is it's a whole of society issue. This is not just about people with disabilities and their allies, but this is something that concerns uh, all of us. And I think the, to make that connection is critical because when we talk about just transition in general, we also remind our, we need to remind ourselves that this is about changing how societies operate, how we interrelate with each other, with nature, and also with future generations. And when we bring this in the context of people with disabilities, it's not any different. And I think uh, this is a key message that we need to have is, is to, to bring in this into all the things that we're doing in the context of, of climate change. I think one thing that, that, that the report concludes, and I think one of the reasons why, why we're here, is that the concept of just transition really needs to be broadened, yeah? I mean, traditionally we think in, in the context of addressing what's going to happen as we shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy, uh, particularly to, uh, and, and the green economy becomes sort of the main driver of uh, employment, but it really needs to be expanded and make this uh, a, an opportunity for a sub substantive social transformation within our societies that leaves, no, you know, I don't know, I don't like saying necessarily not, not leaving everybody, nobody, I don't say don't leave anybody behind, but bring everybody forward particularly uh, those women and men living with disabilities. And I think to the degree that we internalized how important this is for all of us, because again, all of society benefits if people with disabilities are part of the, uh, of the just transition. So I think that's, uh, that's, I think, one of the things from the report that I really, uh, that I really liked as, as you presented them. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos. I was just attending uh, an, another uh, of these uh, thousands of side events that are happening <laughs> these days, which was also around just transition pathways. And one of the speakers of that uh, side event was the Belgian minister, climate change, environment, I, guess, I mean, I don't know the title, but she explained the process that they had followed in Belgium in order to have a just transition plan. And I was impressed to hear about the process because it was very, very uh, participatory in terms of uh, social dialogue which is very close to the heart of the ILO, so employers, trade unions, but also civil dialogue. And in that civil dialogue, she explicitly mentioned more than once the participation also of organizations of persons with disabilities. No? And this is still something that is, that is happening on a very exceptional basis. And I think this is what we need now to, be, to, make, to make it systematic. And I hope that our publication and the work we're doing can contribute to that. Let me now uh, follow on with a second question to, to Ambrose. Ambrose, you have been uh, doing such a great work, um, like for the world in, in Uganda and other African countries, to promote the employment of persons with disabilities in the rural sector. And I was just wondering, how much is that work uh, already dealing with, uh, with, uh, with the impact of climate change, uh, green jobs, and all that? Any good examples or your reflections on that would be most welcome. Thanks very much. Very interesting question. I can give uh, uh, probably, I will later give my colleague Her Elham to share something. But uh, we, as Light for the World, we always work in partnership with the organizations of persons with disabilities, especially the umbrella federations. They play a key role in our work to ensure that all economic empowerment programs, policies, services are disability inclusive of the needs of persons with disabilities. And as we talk about climate change, what is very key in our work? Because we always work with the farmers groups, agri-entrepreneurs, and even other actors around As we have realized, 
uh, in Africa, even in Mozambique, some of you witnessed the cyclone that waves that really swept the country. A lot of floods. The seasonal, seasonal changes always affect, especially persons with disabilities and even agricultural practices, even enterprise or businesses. And with that in mind, we as Light for the World, what we have been trying to do to innovatively come up with different approaches. And for today, for this session, I just want to highlight uh, the three approaches we are using. Oh, I can even use the word some practices. And especially, this has happened under the SPAC program being funded by IFAD, which is uh, being co implemented by LO. One approach is the Agri Lab. Agri Lab is a, it's really this one, na natures, uh, and creates capacities of persons with disabilities where they come together, make decisions on attempting to solve the solutions they always face in their lives. Especially, the output of that is coming up with the assistive agricultural technologies, which can be much more related to the environment or climate that takes place. They always come up internally in a group. At a country level, they discuss how can we better solve this challenge we are facing and look at the climate change. What should we do? The second approach uh, is to look at green value chain. Light for the World came up with a simple tool on value chain, which can help to identify different opportunities by identifying the challenges and the barriers within the value chain uh, system. They can be able to identify the challenge or a barrier. So the person with disabilities, they sit together. They think critically, how can we be able to remove this barrier? And the barriers can happen at different levels of value chain. The third approach, and from our engagement with persons with disabilities, we identify that it's very important to make persons with disabilities in the driving seat to be in the driving seat. It's not only consulting them alone, but making them actively involved. Like I personally being here, I have a hearing impairment, I'm a deaf, deaf person, I'm the thematic director for disability inclusion within light for the world. So for us, we believe that if persons with disabilities themselves Using their lived experiences, ladies and gentlemen, they are able to provide a clear training, expertise on disability inclusion, and they can be very key players. As you made the presentation from this research, there has been a lot of knowledge gap with different, different stakeholders. So they support this stakeholders in order to make the just transition happen. What does it call for? We need some people who can facilitate those processes, who can be able to provide the knowledge on how inclusion happens. You know, personal disabilities, you know the problem. The problem is there. There is lament. Climate change is affecting us. But many stakeholders don't know how, the how bit of it to solve the challenges persons with disabilities are facing. So, probably, right for the world, we came up with the approach we call disability inclusion facilitators model. And this has been tested even in Malawi, Mozambique, India, under the SPACA program, and it has been very successful. So we identify these young persons with disabilities, they have lived experiences, 
we train them on how they could use their lived experience to make change happen. Why? We believe that if a person with is being a person with disability alone, does not automatically make you be an expert on disability inclusion. So we have a, a disability. We train you to shift your mindset from the what, from knowing the problem, and then you shift on how to solve the problem they are facing in reality. And with the three approaches, I feel they are very key and they are able to make personal disability included in a green economy. And before I resum up, very important to look at partnership. Out of your presentation, I see partnership is very key in your work for effective inclusion of personal disabilities, especially in the green economy, we can't do it without partnership. And this is related to sustainable development goal number 17. And when talk of disability inclusion, the key partners are the organizations of personal disabilities, OPDs, and also disability includes part, uh, expert organizations like Light for the World, uh, CBM, and the others. So when they come together, I'm very sure we're able to make the change we need. So as we work towards just transition, very important to always ask ourselves, some three key questions. Number one, is our resilient solutions and green job accessible to persons with disabilities? Second question, are we consulting and involving persons with disabilities and not this in their diversity? and they are representative organizations in these processes. The third question we need to ask ourselves, can we have examples to show the world that uh, in inclusion and green economy is able to benefit all of, all, all of people? So with those three questions, it can help us to always drive towards a disability inclusion in a just transition. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose. Let me now ask, I mean, it was great to hear all these uh, very um, country-specific uh, experiences. No? You're really working on the ground, uh, disability inclusion facilitators, the disability inclusive um, uh, value chain analysis and all that. And now I, I move over to Elham, who a bit like like me and probably like Juan Carlos, we are more at the sort of more global policy level. No? Um, and uh, Elham, I know that uh, from Ida you have made an analysis of, the, um, of how disability inclusion is being addressed in, in national uh, determined contribution, national adaptation plans. And I, I think it, it gives us um, a good picture still about the, the, I would say, the challenges that are still ahead of us and which also need to be addressed. And that's why it's so important that we are all now lobbying at for, for more, more explicit reference to persons with disabilities in the different main outcomes of COP28, including the Just Transition Workaround. But perhaps, Elam, you can share briefly with us the, the analysis that, that you made. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, yeah, this is a work that we have been doing since 2022, together with the uh, Disability Inclusion Climate Action uh, Research Program at McGill University, uh, led by Professor Jodwan and his team. Um, so since 2022, we have been looking at every single uh, nationally determined contribution and national adaptation plan adopted by uh, all 195 states parties to the Paris Agreement. And um, so what we have found is very um, concerning. We have found that 80% of um, governments worldwide, which um, do not have any reference whatsoever 
to disability in their nationally determined contribution. Only 39 out of 195 have some reference. And even those who reference uh, keep it very vague and just list people with disabilities mostly as a vulner vulnerable group that needs to be protected. Only in 15 nationally determined contributions, we have concrete measures that governments will take to ensure that people with disabilities are included. Only in six of them, they make a reference to rights of people with disabilities. Four of them just mentioned um, and recognize the knowledge of people with disabilities. We just heard from our colleague how it is important to consult with people with disabilities and their organizations. And we have evidence that only in two out of these 39 countries, uh, people with disabilities were actually involved in the process of uh, drafting the nationally determined contribution. So that just indicates what a long way we have to go. And when it, we look at national adaptation plans, it's a slightly better news. We have quite a bit of progress, especially since last year. So in 2022, November, because we did this analysis twice uh, in 2022, once in uh, June and the second time in November. Um, so in uh, November 2022, out of the 195 states, we had 46 of them mentioned people with disabilities in national adaptation plans. Uh, and this number increased to 65 uh, in November 1st, 2023, which is a good progress. Uh, but again, we face the same challenge, which is um, a lack of um, concrete detailed measures and keep the references quite vague and general. So only in um, 27 out of the 65 states, we have some national adapta adaptation plans we have some uh, reference on concrete measures on how they want to make sure that their national adaptation plans are inclusive and accessible to people with disabilities. I mean, we don't know uh, how many of those concrete measures are related to just transition. What we know, I think it's in the report as well, is that only in one third of the nationally determined contributions, there are some actually reference to just transition. So I don't think that the, there, is, there is a lot of um, nationally determined contributions that do mention uh, inclusion of people with disabilities in just transition. That just means that we need to make sure to target the um, governments, the policy makers, to make sure that their work and the policies are um, inclusive of people with disabilities. We know that the nationally determined contributions are to be renewed every, every five years. So I think it is important that we find out in our respective countries when uh, the nationally determined contributions will be renewed. We need to find out if it does mention just transition, we need to find out uh, who are the decision makers and policy makers and reach out to them. We also need to advocate with the governments to make sure that people with disabilities as well as just transition advocates are involved in the process of the nationally determined contributions uh, for next round. I think um, this would help a lot. Of course, we all know that inclusive policy is necessary, but not enough for inclusion. For inclusion, we need inclusive action. We need inclusive uh, funding, inclusive budgeting. And in my opinion, one important thing is uh, inclusive attitudes and the stigmatizing disability. So for example, in a topic like um, just transition, it is important to make sure that the attitudes of policymakers, um, employers uh, are changed to make sure that they understand the value of making their just transition inclusive. I think that's an important part that uh, OPDs, organizations of persons with disabilities can play an important role. So that's all from my side. I really hope that this report helps that uh, as you mentioned, Stefan, we are having this new project, another part of the project um, under the United Nations Partnership on Rights of People with Disabilities that Stefan mentioned, is going to focus on just transition. Another part is uh, developing a guidance on implementing nationally determined contributions, uh, making sure that they are inclusive of people with disabilities. I think the intersection of the just transition work and the nationally determined contributions 
is very valuable and I think this project is perfectly fit to make sure that uh, these are um, mutually reinforcing. So I look forward to continue working on this and hope that uh, in next COP um, we have better news and maybe some best practices from the ground to share. Thank you, Elham. You, your reference to vulnerable groups just reminded me that in the current text of the Just Transition Work Program, in the paragraph where we would like to see persons with disabilities, now there's only a reference, well, there's a reference to gender, youth, uh, indigenous, very important, but then it speaks about vulnerable groups. And uh, from a disability perspective, we always don't, we just don't like that term. V first, we, d we don't like that people with disabilities are lumped there in this brick category, but I think no group wants to be called a vulnerable group. Peop groups are made vulnerable by society or by, or by all that, no? So I think it's, and it's always very important to have an explicit reference to persons with disabilities. So that is basically our main advocacy goal for the next uh, 48 hours, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Juan Carlos, um, I will um, pass now the floor to you for um, the final remarks that we had agreed initially, which are a bit shorter now because you've already intervened as a reaction to the report. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if I have a, a lot to add to, to what has been a very uh, fruitful discussion. I'm just going to share with you uh, a, a few thoughts uh, on uh, that reflect also what guides uh, our work in IFAD and why we have made uh, work uh, with people with disabilities and the inclusion of people with disabilities uh, such a critical component of our work. I mean, at the end of the day, a diverse workforce which includes people with disabilities brings a variety of perspectives and problem-solving approaches and functions that are really important as we create of, uh, this puzzle uh, that the green transition will be. This diversity can lead to innovative solutions that might not be immediately apparent if we were to have a much more homogeneous uh, group. And this is where inclusivity intersects with sustainability. Creating green jobs that are open to everyone, jobs that empower and sustain not our environment, but also our diverse global community. I just want to share a little bit about why this is important. Uh, as you may know, IFAD focuses on the work on rural communities, and I think this is an area where people with disabilities uh, play a critical role, and in their inclusion, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, very important. In rural communities where resources and services are often scarce, every individual contribution is vital. Persons with disabilities, when given the right tools and opportunities, can play pivotal roles in their communities. Their economic empowerment leads to a ripple effect benefiting their families, but the entire community at large. Let us remember, impairment in itself, in a physical, mental, sensory condition that may limit persons' movement, senses of, of activities, <clears throat> and what is, what is relevant is the external barriers, and that is and societal attitudes, physical obstacles, or systemic structures that can transform that impairment into a disability. And that's what we are working to get rid of. When individuals with impairment encounter environments that are not accommodating or inclusive, they are hindered from fully participating in societal activities. Thus, it's not the impairment, but the barriers that we as society have placed that are truly disabling an individual. If it recognizes that achieving disability inclusion is not just a goal, but a critical component in our pursuit for, of a more equitable world. Our recent efforts have been geared towards ensuring that we are better equipped to mainstream disability and design and deliver rural development programs that are socially inclusive. We have taken significant steps, but we, it is still a relatively new area of work, and we really need your help. We need to learn from us, and we need your guidance. Um, we uh, recently approved our first disability inclusion strategy for the next five years. This strategy is aligned with the UN disability inclusion strategy and the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this is really a beacon that is guiding our efforts to raise EFAT standards and performance on disability inclusion. We recognize the unique contributions and needs of persons with disabilities in achieving envir environmental goals. Our commitment goes beyond policy. It is about action, 
an impact. And this is where, as an Ambrose mentioned, we have uh, rolled out the SPAR program. We started implementing in 2021 with Light of the World, Procasur, uh, and ILO. And I think uh, this should be, uh, this shows our dedication or our effort to effect changes in the lives of people living with disabilities, particularly in rural, in rural areas. We are working in uh, Burkina Faso, India, Mozambique, and Malawi. We have already reached out to about 7,000 women and men living uh, with disabilities. Through an integrated approach, we aim to empower these individuals or to be fully engaged in the economic activities of selected agricultural and pastoral value change. This program seeks to raise awareness about the potential and the needs of the people with disabilities, fostering a more inclusive environment for all of us. Not just for them, it is for all of us because we all benefit. It is essential to note that while the SPAR program has a specific target countries, it, its influence is not limited to those regions or the countries that I just mentioned. Other countries can benefit from the program's help desk function, ensuring that the impact of our effort is widespread. What this help desk is, we have available resources, lessons learned that we can reach with others that are implementing similar activities in, in other countries. In conclusion, as we embark in this journey, which is a journey of all of us together, let us remember that our collective efforts can pave the way for a more inclusive world. A world where every individual, regardless of, of their abilities has an equal opportunity to thrive, enjoy equal rights and opportunities, and contribute to a greener society. For the green transition to be truly just, it is important to commit ourselves to global cooperation and take all necessary efforts to fulfill our commitments. We need stronger collaboration to ensure that every individual can benefit from the fast-growing green transition which is heavily dependent on factors such as access to financial resources, information, and technology transfer that we need to make available to all of, of us, including people with disabilities. Let's continue to work hand in hand, ensuring not just that no one is left is behind, but that everybody moves forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos, for these uh, closing remarks. Uh, you've already applauded the, the, the panel, so thanks really, um, Juan Carlos, Ambrose, and, and Elham for being with us uh, on this very busy day. So you, you will probably now run back to your advocacy work. And just to mention that we have recorded this session. We will also then uh, produce a uh, YouTube version with, with captioning. I, I know that today uh, the accessibility has not been at, at the usual standard that we're using for, for our meetings, but it was not technically possible. But we will have a recorded version of this session with, uh, with subtitles soon, soon available. And again, thank, thanks all, all for all of you for, uh, for attending, and um, have a good afternoon.